Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines Protests against police brutality in Nigeria met with violent repression. Colombian social Minga continues to wait for a meeting with President Ivan Duque. US removes Sudan from terror list. Workers' Party of Belgium demands stronger measures to counter COVID crisis. In our first story, the popular protests against police brutality in Nigeria, which began earlier this month, face a fresh set of challenges as armed thugs have been roaming the streets in some provinces. The governor of the southern state, Edo, Godwin Obaseki, imposed a 24-hour curfew and outlawed the protests after a prison break in Benin City on the morning of Monday. Video clips show thugs on a rampage breaking into the prison and fleeing in bits. A section of protesters, however, has expressed the doubt that the jailbreak was orchestrated in, to create an excuse to stop the end SARS protests, which have been going on since October 8th. Protesters across Nigeria have been demanding police reforms and the dismantling of the Special Anti-Robbery Squad or SARS, which is accused of murder, torture, extortion and other atrocities. Leo, a protester for Abuja, from Abuja, told People's Dispatch that the incident took place in a maximum security prison which hasn't had an incident of jailbreak since 1989. He strongly believes that the jailbreak was planned and that the authorities were trying to make it look like the NSARS protesters made it happen. Earlier, protesters who had camped at the demonstration outside the central bank of Nigeria in the capital city Abuja were dispersed by thugs who were armed with sharp weapons and guns. 30 to 40 policemen were present in the area, whom the protesters accused of standing by and watching while the incident took place. Once the protesters ran for safety from bullets, Leo said that the hired goons burned the truck on which the protesters had mounted their speakers. The camp they had set up for the night was also torched. One woman protester was physically beaten up and was hospitalized with injuries to her leg. Another protester was grazed by a bullet. On October 11, the Inspector General of Police had announced dissolution of SARS in response to the yearnings of the Nigerian people, according to him. His statement, however, added that all officers and men of this unit would be redeployed with immediate effect. Two days later, the formation of the Special Weapons and Tactics Unit was announced. This move was widely criticized by protesters as a mere renaming of the unit. In our second story, we now move to Colombia where an indigenous Minga is awaiting an audience with President Ivan Duque. On October 6, the indigenous Afro-descendant peasant social and students organizations from southwestern Colombia had held a press conference calling for a social and community Minga for the defense of life, territory, democracy and peace. This was to begin on October 10th. Minga refers to collective voluntary work for the benefit of the community. The organizations announced a peaceful march from the Popayan to the uh, city of Kali. The march demanded a meeting with President Ivan Duque to demand his, seek his immediate response to the various issues faced by the communities across the country. They invited President Duque to meet them at the San Francisco Plaza in Kali on October 12th. In a letter addressed to the head of state, the organizations denounced the resurgence of violence in the territories. The letter pointed to the recent rise in massacre, systemic assassination of land defenders and community leaders, and forced displacements. They also demanded compliance with the peace agreement signed between the former government and the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, FARC, in Havana in 2016. Citing the government's refusal to respond on October 14, the Minga decided to march to the capital city, Bogota, to meet the president. After traveling for three days, more than 7,000 indigenous and black people, peasants and students, students and women arrived in Bogota on October 18 to demand urgent actions over the spiraling human rights crisis in the country. On October 17, Ombudsman Carlos Carmago offered to be the mediator for the first meeting with President Duque and the representatives of the Minga. However, as of today, President Duque has not confirmed where and when he'll be meeting the representatives of the Minga. With the aim of putting pressure on the government and the President and the national government, the organizations have called for a massive national mobilization for this Wednesday, that's tomorrow. In our next story on Monday, the President of the United States, Donald Trump, announced that Sudan will be removed from the list of states sponsoring terrorism. The decision comes after a transitional government in Sudan agreed to pay US dollars 335 million as compensation to the victims of terror attacks on US embassies in Tanzania and Kenya in 1998 and on the US ship USS Cole in 2000. Talks over the compensation amount have been ongoing between Sudan and the US since 2018. However, the announcement of the deal before the presidential polls in the US is considered to be part of Trump's attempt to end Israeli isolation in the Middle East region. This is also because the US has been pressurizing Arab countries to normalize their relations with Israel for the past couple of months. Last month, it mediated normalization deals between Israel and the UAE and Bahrain. Mike Pompeo, the US Secretary of State, visited Sudan in August to pers persuade it to do the same. However, Sudan's transitional government led by Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok refused due to the apprehension of popular unrest. 
The compensation is mon money is supposed to go to the families of American victims killed in the attacks. The US had blamed Sudan's Omar al-Bashir government for supporting and sheltering the terrorists and had Sudan on a list of states sponsoring terrorism since 1993. There are three more countries in the US list, Syria, Iran and North Korea. Though the US president can issue the order for the removal of Sudan from the list, for the compensation money to reach the victims' families, Congress needs to pass legislation. The US government has alleged that those responsible for the attacks in which hundreds were killed, included a large, including a large number of citizens, US citizens, were operating from Sudan. Al-Bashir was opposed from power in a popular uprising in Sudan last year. The transitional government of Sudan hopes that its removal from the terror list will boost the country's economic prospects. And finally, we go to Belgium, where last week the Workers' Party of Belgium demanded that the government ensure full income for workers in quarantine across the country. The proposal was made by party deputy Raoul Hedebau in the federal parliament in the wake of rising distress among workers affected by a new spike in COVID-19. The party also demanded more backup funds for the health sector, support for workers in food catering, restaurants, cafes, bars and the hotel industry and increased social benefits. Belgium has been seeing a sharp spike in COVID-19 infections. On October 13th alone, over 10,400 new cases were reported, marking the highest daily rise since the outbreak of the pandemic. On Friday, the government reimposed nighttime curfews and ordered the closure of cafes, bars and restaurants for the month. The Workers' Party of Belgium, Deputy Germain Mugamango, proposed in the Walloon Parliament on Friday the provisioning of an emergency fund to hire 1,000 people in the province Socialist Party Reform Movement Ecolo Majority Government rejected the proposal. Meanwhile, the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister of Belgium, Vincent van Pietergem, called for a more proportionate contribution from the country's millionaires during the current crisis. In this regard, Workers' Party has, always, has been long demanding a concrete proposal for ensuring mandatory and fair tax contributions from the rich. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch. Yeah, I'm